So I'm delighted to be here. I was delighted to be asked to give this talk and, and particularly also be asked to provide uh, readings. You know, that, that's, that's like a professor's dream <laughs> that you just don't come to hear, but you're actually coming uh, perhaps with having read something as well. I teach in BPATS, um, so I know the direct impact of the Charlotte Newcomb Foundation scholarship as well as the particular joy in advising and teaching mature women returning to school. They are the very best students I have had and also long after they graduate, some of my most inspiring friends still. Um, this talk allows me to sort of bring together some of the research we've done for our university lecture course on the history of the new school with my, who I call my co-conspirator, Mark Larimore, who's a faculty member in religious studies at Eugene Lang College. Um, but it also prodded me to conduct some more research um, because we had sort of pieced One second. <laughs> there they are back there fixing it. Uh, it's, it's back. Um, we had pieces of the story, but to kind of create a more sort of uh, overall view of women at the New School, and particularly there was a middle 20th century piece missing. So I was able to conduct some research on that part, which I had always wanted to. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, the New School claims quite a few firsts. Um, which, all of which are open to question and more research. Um, we claim to have offered the first course in African American history taught by W.B. Du Bois in 1948. I would actually suspect that historically black colleges and universities may have had such a course before then. Um, we claim to have offered the first courses in urban planning and architecture, the latter taught by Lewis Mumford, the famous urban theorist, um, in 1923. Um, we claim to have offered the first course in film as an art form in 1926. There's a competing claim from Columbia University that offered a similar course, perhaps, on film 10 years prior. But uh, another one of the firsts we claim is to have offered the first course in women's history by Gerda Lerner in 1962. As I hope you might have read in the introduction to her book, The Majority Finds Its Past, Placing Women in History, what may have been as unusual as the topic was the fact that she had not yet completed a, a bachelor's degree. She was here as an older woman returning to school, taking courses in the program in which I teach. Another often overlooked point about this course is that the first time it was offered, it did not run. It didn't run because there were not enough people interested in taking it which is also perhaps another issue that we don't really address with firsts. Um, the next semester, she did some promotional work and got enough students for the course to run. So there may be a pattern of courses not running, which may, uh, of, of these ones that we actually claim to be so important. Was there an audience, in fact, for these topics is the question. As with most parts of our past, uh, myth overtakes the facts a lot of the time, and at the New School, the myth of being first in these various ways has taken over a more nuanced and I think a more interesting history. Um, and one of the most interesting parts of that is the crucial role of women in the school, as President Van Zandt just mentioned. They are students, faculty, donors, staff, administrators. From what we can tell from the spotty record regarding students, the school has always attracted more female than male students, and that trend continues today in, in fact, the BPATS program, as well as many other programs across the university. My fellow New School historian, Mark Larimore, put this together brilliantly as a way in which to understand one of the predominant myths of our school's founding by suggesting that John Dewey and Hannah Arendt had a baby called the New School. <laughs> These are people that we are very proud to talk about and who were indeed associated with uh, the school, but not in the way that their names get bandied about. In fact, the founders who had far more to do with putting the school together were these men, James Harvey Robinson, Charles Beard, and Herbert Crowley. This gets more right. It gets right the importance of a movement called New History, um, which Charles Beard and Gen James Harvey Robinson spearheaded, um, and also the role of the New Republic, which I'll talk about in uh, a moment. Just a shout out to historians that Dewey and Arendt are philosophers, but it's actually the historians who really started the school. And they did so with um, an understanding and an attempt that was built on their scholarship, which was not to sort of keep a revered view of a classical past, but was in fact to use the past as a means to change the present and the future. The past wasn't something to be preserved or something to hold pristine and unchanged, it was something to use. 
this is um, part of what prompted Charles Beard to uh, move from Columbia University. Um, just an aside, that's actually probably more important to this story than an aside, but he's married to Mary Beard, who was arguably the first to put women into the writing of the American past. They wrote many books together. She wrote many uh, books herself, uh, specifically on women in American history although she doesn't seem to have ever taught at the New School, but perhaps she was influencing Charles on various things. Um, Beard and Robinson both come from Columbia, and they, are, they leave Columbia because they are um, protesting a tenure case, and particularly a tenure case at the university in Columbia that is about a professors who were um, speaking out about the entry of the United States into World War I. And more precisely, it's about not pacifism per se, as those professors were very involved with that political movement, but in fact, um, the faculty governance issue that, that the, the president and the board of trustees of Columbia University had overturned the faculty decision about tenuring these uh, faculty members because of their pacifist positions. So this disagreement with the president of Columbia um, led to them leaving and led to a conversation with others at the New Republic. Um, the New Republic is uh, an interesting part of our history that, in fact, has been overlooked, I think. And you know, it is part of a, of a movement uh, that where many things were new at this moment in the 1910s and 1920s. An interest um, not with change or rupture as much as with action and with progress. Um, the New Republic title is instructive, I think, for the, the prominence of the word new, but also for what followed, Republic. The magazine wasn't concerned with revolution. It wasn't, in fact, uh, that radical. Most of its writers supported the United States uh, intervention into World War I, for instance. It was about reinvigorating government um, to dedicate itself to solving society's problems with expertise from, from particularly new fields of social research, such as anthropology, sociology, economics, and political science. So this essay, A School of Social Research, was written by Crowley in June of 1918. And they had offices at 23rd Street and 8th Avenue, and the New Republic is really, I think, the incubator for the school. Uh, Charles Beard, James Harvey Robinson wrote in the New Republic. So we ask a very different question, I think, if we look not just to John Dewey's important ideas about education, but we ask what kind of school begins out of a very young, bi-weekly magazine dedicated to progressive politics. In the proposal that uh, is written about uh, the founding of a new school in 1918, and it is a fascinating document, I'll take you very quickly through it, but it's very short and can be found on our website, um, thenewschoolhistory.org, and it's a fascinating read. Um, one of the things that you realize that in focusing on the founding as we have is that we have not actually realized the important role of women. It's a school for men and women, as it says here, an independent school of social science for men and women. It's um, the organization committee on the left here is half women, including Mrs. Leonard Hand, the wife of a prominent federal judge who was friends with Herbert Crowley. Mr. Hand, in fact, had helped launch the New Republic. It also includes Mrs. Willard Strait, Dorothy Strait, who gave money for the townships on 23rd Street and 8th Avenue, right near the offices of the New Republic that served as the first buildings of the school. The proposal goes through the, the sort of issues of what's prompting this new mo idea and a new model of, of a school. And I, I just the, on the red on below sort of highlight certain sort of phrases that are kind of key um, to the moment of 1918. So uh, uh, the, the impact of industrialization, the importance of kind of leadership, in fact leadership that had been missing in many ways from the presidency and was now taken over by tycoons in the light late 19th century, trying to wrest control of um, sort of the dominance of the politics back towards government itself. Um, the, the Great War is obviously a reference to World War I that had just ended. Um, a first-hand knowledge of the world of actual endeavor. This is the impact of the new social sciences, that things could not just be understood by books. In fact, you had to go out into a field um, and figure it out from, from the field, if you will. Um, this is uh, trained workers of scientific insight, the importance of sort of hypotheses, evidence testing that were coming uh, into the social sciences in a new way trying to bridge the fields of the hard sciences and the humanities. 
Um, so this broader application of scientific method applied to a social problems. The growth of labor organization, very uh, huge union movement that's occurring at this time. The granting of suffrage to women, which of course had not quite yet passed, that's in 1919, um, but could be seen to be coming very much, that that was going to really change uh, what uh, the political system was going to be about. Uh, people thought that this would make an enormous difference on issues and legislation by adding morality uh, of women to the political sphere. Um, women were thought to support pacifism and temperance movements in particular. Um, city, state, and national governments undertaking new functions. This was to reinvigorate government to, to, uh, at all levels to tackle more difficult problems rather than leaving it to the private sphere. And then finally, the growing complexity and significance of international relations, the complex world that was uh, being understood uh, with the founding of the League of Nations at the end of World War I. So these classes, how do you put that into a, cur into a curriculum? These were the first lectures offered in the spring of 1919. Um, what's interesting is some very prominent names that you may have heard of, Thor Thorsten Veblen probably being the most famous, but Robinson Beard, a woman. Emily James Putnam, um, a woman being quite, uh, quite unusual given that, for instance, Columbia University had no women on its faculty. In the first year of study, you can see a little bit more as how it gets fleshed out. Um, it, here we have um, a course taught by yet another woman uh, on a, perhaps an unusual topic. Elsie Clues Parsons was an anthropologist, sociologist, and folklorist, and a feminist. She studied uh, Native American tribes and was the first female president of the American Anthropology uh, Association. She, we, we, there's reference to her helping start the new school and conversations at the New Republic, but we haven't uncovered exactly what her impact was, and in fact, she leaves very, quick, very quickly. Um, so the earliest, these are some of the things that we have uncovered are some of these publicity scrapbooks uh, from the early period, the, uh, before the internet, clipping files, right, clipping services that actually would take every single appearance of the new school and paste them in a scrapbook. Um, so we have them now digitized and they are such a fascinating read uh, and as a sort of an art person, also incredibly beautiful artifacts I would say as well. The early publicity of the opening of the school actually involved the Junior League, the organization in which young white women of means found companionship and charity work, and whose president of the New York chapter was Dorothy Strait. The League was considering requiring new members to take courses as part of its membership. The majority of young debutantes who joined the League were not college graduates. The courses would be intended to train young women in social problems to which they could apply themselves in university, in volunteer work. This is an up close of that same article, series of articles. There was debate over this requirement, but also over whether or not the new school was the appropriate place to take such courses. In particular, there was concern that the courses were led by male lecturers who were, quote, not suitable. <laughs> that is, they were affiliated with radical causes, such as the union, the IWW. The new school entered the fray to claim that their courses were too advanced for young women without any uh, college education or training. The U Junior League decided to pair with Barnard to create courses that suited their constituency and purpose. I just want to, make, these are sort of titles from articles at the opening of the school. Um, never free and, and not now. <laughs> so that was some ideal that actually was never put into practice. Um, this is a small and forgotten incident, the Junior League incident, but what it exposes is that the role of women in education was a new and still controversial question. Women, mainly white and privileged, were going to college in unprecedented numbers, a, tra a trend that would continue throughout the 1920s. The new school had a different relation to that larger demographic trend as it did not offer degrees. Um, and at this point, defiantly so, it was not a degree-seeking place. Degrees were thought, in fact, to corrupt the real main ideal of education. Its mission was to continue to educate grown-ups, as they were called, to retrain workers, to arm citizens with information and skills to change the world. But did that include women? We have this fascinating fundraising document from 1925 that gives us a little bit of a hint. The school is only six years old. Certain things are being confirmed even at that moment that are, I think, fundamental to understanding the school today. 
Um, there's a confirmation in, in the very first mention, or the very first pages, of the importance of John Dewey and his ideas to the school. Dewey did teach a lecture here. He was obviously consulted on uh, many ideas about the school. He celebrated his 70th, 80th, and 90th birthday celebrations here at the new school, so it was an affiliation that he obviously um, was happy to have. But he never left Columbia University. He was never a full-time faculty member here. Even more interestingly, we have a faculty of picked men. The women are gone uh, at this point. Um, they are also, when they discuss the distinctive features, which you might not be able to read clearly, but um, the features are men and women, they claim. Unprecedented role of students and the faculty are men. Students, we finally get a little snapshot of who they are. Since it started, there have been 5,000 students. Enrollment is 1,000 in fall of 1925. And more than 30% are men. An interesting way to say that the majority were women. They are older. Some are immigrants. That is, more than two-thirds are American-born, as the way that they put it. We think that there were a number of Jews that were a part of the audience, um, but we can't quite confirm that uh, in terms of the record. The board of trustees, the board of directors, as it was called, are now 14 people, eight of whom are women, an increase from six to tw of, of the 12 just a few years earlier. But this isn't the story that we tell of our school. As with uh, most stories, we want to believe that one individual can make all the difference, and sometimes they can. So in history, we have come to call this approach um, telling it through the lives of powerful, influ influential people, the great man approach to history. The great man is George Washington rather than the overreach of empire. The great man is Abraham Lincoln rather than slaves risking their lives to gain freedom. The great man is John D. Rockefeller rather than the combined force of industrialization and capitalism. In the story of the New School, the great man approach might begin with John Dewey, but in that narrative, Dewey himself would soon be overtaken by Alvin Johnson. He was there at the creation and remained powerful for the next 40 years, officially retiring from being president in 1945, but remaining influential until the end of his life in 1971. You could write a history of the New School that is all about Alvin Johnson, and most of them have been. If you knew to look for him, you would find him in the organizing committee at the beginning of the proposal for an independent school of social science. If you knew to look for him, you could find him at the New Republic, where he was an editor. If you knew to look for him, you could even find him at Columbia University, from which he graduated with a doctorate in economics and was on its faculty for a few years. Johnson was not a native New Yorker. He was born on my birthday in 1874 in Nebraska, and he attended the University of Nebraska for his bachelor's degree. Our, one of our uh, former presidents was former Senator Bob Kerry, the second president from Nebraska, as he liked to make very much of this connection to uh, our great man of the New School. He came, Johnson came to New York City to attend Columbia and found his calling less as a teacher than as an editor and an administrator. We don't often herald those talents, but if Johnson is any example of their effect, perhaps we should. Because it was those skills that this floundering New School needed. One of the famous incidents of the early years was that Thorsten Veblen was a mutterer, and you could not understand him lecturing. So Johnson arranged for a kind of early microphone, and Veblen tore it up and, and refused to actually speak. He did not want to be heard. Um, he soon left. <laughs> and by 1922, just three years after the start of the school, it was full of acrimony and unsure of its future. We've come to call this, Mark and I, the seven-semester itch. Um, Beard and Crow Crowley had hoped that the school would be a kind of research institute, and it, it did not have the funds to achieve that. Robinson, on the other hand, liked the lecture series approach that had developed and thought the school should be primarily a kind of bureau of lectures. And no one was really running it, making day-to-day -day decisions, managing with more than the next day in mind. A couple of members of the board thought an outside insider was needed. Johnson was the appropriate person, someone who knew all the players and had been involved in the founding but was not involved in the day-to-day -day activities nor on the faculty. Johnson agreed to think through the possibilities. He looked at the finances more closely and reasoned that the lectures, the adult education for which the school was becoming known, provided the income supplemented with occasional donations from various wealthy people. There was no way in its current state that the school could support a research institute. He did not give up on that possibility, but put it off. 
for a later time. In this initial step, Johnson was already proving his administrative chops, coming up with compromises that antagonized the fewest number of people. Even so, Beard, Robinson, and Crowley, those people that we call the founders, Mark and I call the founders, left along with some board members. This is one of, I don't know if Sylvia mentioned, if anybody been on the art, tour, art collection, this was one of probably the most famous uh, uh, part of our art collection that is no longer here but was sold in the early 1980s to pay some bills and uh, fortunately now is at the Metropolitan and highly recommended, uh, an incredible mural by Thomas Hart Benton. And I'm only bringing it up because as Sylvia has taught us, on the bottom right corner is uh, Thomas Hart Benton who's standing up uh, over Alvin Johnson. It was the commission that Alvin Johnson asked uh, Benton and gave him full reign to do, and this mural really prompted um, Benton's larger fame. So Beard and Robinson had attracted the bulk of the student body through their notorious lectures, but Johnson thought he could survive, the school could survive by leaving, uh, their leaving, by turning the school more resolutely towards students. He listened to what they wanted and began to offer courses, not just in social sciences and policy, but also in psychology, literature, and the arts. By the mid-1920s, these courses garnered a great deal of publicity and became the bulk of the school. He became the director of the school in 1923, instituting a more formal administrative structure while keeping a faculty board that oversaw the faculty and curriculum. Um, I, I want to, use, I'm not gonna talk about the University in Exile and the beginning of the Graduate Faculty for Political and Social Science, but it's an enormously important part of our school and uh, Alvin Johnson was key in 1933, reacting within days of Hitler's denunciation of, um, and um, resolution that, that basically left all Jews, um, uh, denied Jews jobs in the universities of Germany. And throughout the rise of fascism in Europe, he initiated the Refugee Scholar Program, gaining um, an enormous amount of money and eventually the huge impact of the Rockefeller Foundation funds behind him, starting in 1933 through 1945. Three, over 300 scholars uh, saved from uh, Europe from a pretty certain death, and um, 181 of those came through the New School. Um, a remarkable commitment uh, to them. They went on to find jobs, most of them went on to find jobs in other institutions, and a small group of them stayed here to form our graduate faculty. Um, I also want to just point out the women in this photograph. This is sort of a famous photograph from what we think is 1946. There are four women in this group of the graduate faculty, um, perhaps more than what might be at other faculties, but not many. I want to just mention them by name. One of my favorites, and I'm afraid I don't have a pointer that's working, but did you see this little woman? I uh, see her little because she was quite small. Frida Wunderlich, this little, this, this face right here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, she was, in fact, one of the original members of the University in Exile, an economist from Berlin. She would, in fact, go on to be elected as dean of the graduate faculty, the first woman in that position. Um, on the other side of the table is Julie Mayer, who was a sociologist. The woman closest to us is um, uh, the psychologist Mary Henley. And then right back in the upper left is a woman, Clara Mayer. But by these efforts, Johnson saved the school. He found its groove in broader adult education. He soothed recalcitrant faculty and went after the latest stars, convincing a psychoanalyst from Budapest to come speak, for instance, and getting the hottest theater critic, Stark Young, to teach a course on a booming era in American theater in 1920s. He let the lectures and courses become the story of the school, working in the background to secure funds. He navigated boards to do what he wanted, going so far as to get around a committee that wasn't doing what he wanted by appointing another one who would, while the initial committee eventually languished. He was the driving force behind saving and providing a home for the refugee scholars and continued, and here, obviously, is our great man. There's a lot about this that's true, but it's not the whole story. Because often behind every great man, there's a great woman. And he not only had a wife, Edith, who lived up in Nyack, homeschooling their seven children. Uh, as it turns out, we've just uh, learned that while having an affair with the new school's publicity director <laughs> and fathering a child with her, um, a rather open secret, and in fact, a part, uh, the, the, the child was telling us this story, who is now uh, an older woman, um, that she was sort of included into uh, coming to the new school and sort of understood everybody understood that to be the child of Alvin Johnson. 
So it's that woman in the corner that I'm going to talk about now. The story of the New School could also be told as the story of Clara Mayer, uh, except we know very little about her. And in fact, we don't have, so far, have not uncovered any photos except the one that I showed you and this portrait in the art collection that was done of her, I think largely based on that photo in many ways. The braids, I mean, how distinctive is that? We know that she came from a New York City German Jewish family, youngest of six children to immigrant parents. Her father became a wealthy realtor and one of her brothers would go on to become an architect. It was his firm that would oversee the knitting together of this building with our 12th Street building in the late 1950s. We know that Clara attended Barnard, graduating in 1915 and completing graduate work at Columbia in the next few years, including work with James Harvey Robinson. Robinson is the one who drew her to the new school where she became a student in the early years and very quickly began working closely with Alvin Johnson. It was Clara who persuaded Johnson that students should have more say in the new school. She set up a students group, later known as the New School Associates, that offered suggestions on what should be taught by whom. She helped widen the curriculum to include more than the social sciences. And she per persuaded her wealthy family to donate funds at necessary moments. She was appointed as a trustee to the board, became secretary to the board, was an assistant director, an associate director, a dean of the School of Philosophy and Liberal Arts, a vice president, and then a dean of the new school. Then a president fired her, worried that she had more influence over the board of trustees than he did. The board fired him. <laughs> but that act did not woo her back to the new school. She turned her back on the school eventually moving to Los Angeles, dying in 1988 at the age of 93 with no immediate survivors. Clara had given her professional life to the new school, running the place while Johnson was its public face. Clara's activities at the school shed light on the vast numbers of people required to make any institution or project run, and yet Clara also had major leadership roles, from trustee to dean to vice president for over 40 years, and we know barely anything about her. What we do know is that she seemed to be instrumental in all that Johnson took credit for. He called her, he wrote a memoir, and in his signing of the memoir and gift to her, he calls her my co-founder. In the text itself, she's barely mentioned. This is even true for some of Johnson's most important successes, including the university faculty in which you saw, uh, the university in exile, graduate faculty in which you saw her pictured there, the building of 66 West 12th, and the consolidation of the arts and the curriculum. You do see little recognitions of the importance that she had. This is a dedication uh, to her uh, for, by Charles Abrams, a famous urban planner at the time who was here for over 30 years and helped really cement the field of urban studies from the 1930s to the 1960s, um, where he dedicates this book that was actually from a series of lectures that he gave at the New School. The book is really from that. Um, there's also a famous story about John Cage, who famously taught uh, composition, a very influential course in composition that inspired many of the famous artists of the 1950s and 60s. He came to Clara Mayer and said, I actually want to teach a course on mushrooms. I think that the close observation necessary to understanding and deciphering and finding mushrooms actually teaches key skills. She said yes. So we know that she had this kind of impact on the school. So I've come to call this the new woman at the new school, the era of Clara Meyer. We know women were the predominant students. We know they were key administrators. We know they were some faculty members. Um, Elsie Clues Park Parsons, Doris Humphrey, more uh, a famous modern dancer of the time, Martha Graham, more famous now perhaps, Bernice, uh, I always say her name wrong, Celia. Bernice Abbott, the incredible photographer who was also on um, the faculty for uh, 30 years. Um, the influence on the curricula of women, courses on sex, family, and marriage, um, but the change from the exclusive focus to politics and policy to arts, literature, and psychology is a far more significant and long-lasting influence. I hear up here the picture of Eleanor Roosevelt because, in fact, she was influential in the school as well, meaning she came here, she talked about the school often in her My Day columns. We actually, Wendy Shire has just found an audio of a lecture um, that she's digitized that you can find on the archives website as well of Eleanor Roosevelt. 
So the next era really um, is, is something a little bit different. But by the 1940s, um, the New School is seen as a school devoted to teaching mature persons, as it was called. It was a laboratory of human affairs. It had 600 courses offered to almost 10,000 students. It even offered a diploma of achievement in advanced adult studies. I would love to know what that was. <laughs> Claire Meyer writes in 1943 here, October 1943, in the New School Bulletin about the New School tradition, in which she now announces that there is going to be degrees for returning GIs. There are going to, in this program, there are going to be no entrance requirements. Um, they are seeking adult students who bring into education the eagerness, the realism of intellectual maturity, as she writes, to answer the question, what did we fight for? She wanted to pass on new knowledge with a minimum of delay. Didn't, these courses would not feature textbooks, which take too long and uh, do not, the thrill of knowledge is lost in them. Choice would be determined by individual students, one course or many, with advice or without it, for a year, for a night, for a lifetime. And that is, in fact, the origin of BPATS. Um, in this press release, though, from 19... Uh, 51, in fact, is a, is a really interesting, and this is what I ended up sort of researching recently. So it's unclear from what we know so far whether the uh, new undergraduate program, the BPATS program, appealed to women as well as men in these early days, although I suspect it did. Um, there's a person in charge of veteran uh, services here, uh, students who, overseeing students who are veterans coming to our school and being a part of our school, and she is going to do some research. So I'm really interested uh, to know whether or not she uncovers uh, women veterans that are taking advantage of the GI Bill too. Mayer, though, turned her attention to women in another way. As with the, was the case with many curricular and program ideas, it was Mayer's idea that the, led to the formation of the Human Relations Center. By 1951, Mayer was vice president and dean of the School of Philosophy and Liberal Arts of what was informally known as the Adult Division, to distinguish it from the graduate faculty with its graduate degree programs. When Mayer heard a presentation on modern women's dilemma, what direction now, in 1950, she saw yet another educational opportunity. And it should be noted that this presentation occurred at a conference sponsored by the group representing students that Mayer had started in the 1920s called the New School Associates. These workshops, um, th so in fall of 1951, the speaker of that presentation that Mayer saw, Alice Rice Cook, offered her first continuing education course at the New School called Women in the Community, a workshop in human relations. 43 women enrolled. The next semester in spring 1952, there were two workshops offered, taking up empty classroom space in the daytime, where most of our courses were taught in the nighttime. By 1955, 650 students were taking classes under the aegis of the Human Relations Center, most of them married white women who had gone to college, were over 40, and 77% identifying themselves as housewives. The purpose of the center was ostensibly to make learning social rather than merely intellectual. The workshop strove to supply, quote, the warmth and stimulation of personal contact, and luncheon was as important as the course in the morning and the one in the afternoon. The social aspect, though, covers a less sanguine purpose, assuaging women's anxiety and depression. It is the warmth and stimulation of personal contact that will also lead to a, quote, adjusted vital personality. Surveys ask students to grade themselves on the relationships with questions such as, is your voice usually pleasant and easily heard? And do you make it easy for people to like you rather than driving them away? Workshops and courses concentrated on building self-awareness and appraisal to increase confidence and enlarge opportunities. It reads now as a sad commentary on many women's lives in the 1950s. And when I went to look in, uh, in the archives to look at the boxes of material about the Human Relations Center, the archivist Jenny Swadish said the materials made her sad. Always trust an archivist. In documenting the center's success, materials included a husband's, thank you for giving me my wife back those fits of nerves she used to indulge and are now completely in the past. And other women claiming that I feel inadequate and at times feel like becoming invisible. The workshops created a sense of belonging and potentialities for growth. One woman even claimed I am becoming more tolerant of my husband and his interests in things different than those I value. Perhaps that was the wife of the woman who claimed he was getting his wife back. 
The need for social and psychological outlets for women then seems understandable enough and corroborates much of what Betty Friedan would uncover in the same time period and label the feminine mystique just a few years later. The purpose was to re-enter society, to find a meaningful social role once children were grown, but why call it the Center for Human Relations? The other, uh, there seems to be two developing fields of which this center was a part. Institute of Human Relations also appeared at other universities such as Harvard, Yale, MIT, and Michigan. These institutes were places of interdisciplinary social science research geared to bringing together various disciplines to solve social problems, much like the founding of the New School. Much of the, uh, most of these functioned as research institutes. Some, like Yale, brought the social sciences into conversation with the medical sciences. And like the Human Relations Center, within a couple of decades of their founding, they morph or disappear. The other developing field at the time was organizational behavior and management. This too came out of the social sciences, particularly sociology, but keyed to labor. Initially, this strain of research emphasized the relation of individuals to organizations with an attention to communication. Its scope grew to look more broadly at individuals and social systems in relation to work, industry, and management. Now we know these fields as organizational behavior, management, and change, but the root was human relations. There's a bit of each of these in the Human Relations Center at the New School. Throughout the workshops and courses, there's an interdisciplinary social science approach, if heavy on psychology, and a concern with succeeding in the public and work spheres. But luncheon seems far more crucial to the center than to either of these fields. And so far, I have found no emphasis on women in the other institutes or on practical applications of these ideas directly on individual lives, as opposed to institutional policy or research impact. The new school seems to have identified a need, mature woman looking for a purpose, and supplied it with its own brand of learning. But this focus and the success of the Human Relations Center was not without its consequences at the new school. In 1961, a new president prompted a closer look at the center. President Henry David asked the dean of the adult division to do an investigation into the Human Relations Center because he was concerned with the independence of the unit and whether these workshops and classes were supplanting or supporting interest in the general adult division courses in the evening. In defending the center, Alice Rice Cook claimed that now there is a new woman, Mrs. Middle-Aged Leisure Time. <laughs> Over 35, with or without children, married, widowed or divorced, few economic problems, good health, intellectually curious, active in community organizations, may have worked for pay before marriage, at least a high school education. Four things Mrs. Middle-Aged Leisure Time wants, to explore and develop her potentialities as a person, to learn to use her mind, to find satisfying work, whether paid or unpaid, to cope more effectively with interpersonal relationships, family, friends, community, world, to make plans for the future. These desires demanded new educational opportunities, what Cook called a two-pronged approach with an individual service program, the workshops, what we might conceive of as intensive advising, in fact, and activity program. Uh, that were not only activities, but included sort of liberal arts uh, classes as well. The first data point that the investigated dean requested, the number of men registered in co courses offered by the Human Relations Center. He then went on to document more concerns, the pre predominance of courses with a psychological orientation, and the use of the feminine pronoun in promotion of courses, asking what happens to the more than 25 males enrollees currently in the program if these assumptions are made. That's 25 males out of approximately 300 students. These questions, the dean claimed, all have one objective, that the educational activities of the new school be superior qualitatively. Perhaps it's not a surprise to learn that at this point, this is the mayor that also fired Clara Mayer claiming that she ran a mom and pop shop, but he may really have been threatened by the close relations she had with the board of trustees. After much of this kind of back and forth, Cook threatened to resign if the essence of the workshops were discontinued. Instead, the president was fired the following year and the dean left a couple of years after that. I bet this is a plaque that some of my fellow colleagues at the new school know but have never really quite figured out. <laughs> and here we have a, a recognition of Alice Rice Cook. It's a plaque outside a lecture hall on the fourth floor in 66 West 12th Street. 
So the Human Relations Center persisted. In fact, Cook initiated a new effort to begin a women's bureau to tie together training and placement programs for women re-entering the labor markets, which was also taking place at women's colleges, Rutgers, and Harvard. This did not come to fruition very well here, but Cook finally received a raise in 1963 and hired Ruth Van Doren as an assistant director who would take over for her when she retired in 1966. So I've called this, uh, in my mind, Making Women Human, the era of Alice Rice Cook. She's applying, sci so, so this Human Relations Center applied social science research and techniques specifically to women, making intellectual work social, providing training for women in these fields. In fact, we think, in fact, uh, that the New School provided much of the sort of hub for the growth of a new field of creative arts therapies in the 1960s and 70s. This is when Gerda Lerner's course is offered and Hannah Arendt finally arrives. Um, I, you probably cannot see the caption, and it's kind of fabulous, so I just want to mention what that cab caption says in that cartoon. Whenever we have a problem, he tells me to take a courses at the new school. So I signed up for advanced creative problem solving on Mondays, alien and alienation and affirmation on Tuesdays, sexual roles in contemporary America on Wednesdays, love, humanity, and aggression on Thursdays. Then he asks me, so what about Fridays? I'm looking at the time. I'm going to finish up uh, as quickly. Um, just to bring it to the present. So in the 1970s, the Human Relations Center uh, focuses more on women in the paid work world. They offer a certificate. There are 3,000 students that are part of it. In spring of 1973, a course by Betty Friedan is taught in the adult division called Women in New York. Eight sessions on the problems females face in New York City. There are three men out of the 90 and 97 women in the course. 10% of the women cross out Miss or Mrs. on the registration cards and substitute it with Ms. There are degree and credit opportunities across the university now. In 1976, the university has 17,000 students, 3,000 degree students at the graduate faculty, 14,000 students in continuing education. We have a senior college, a Par Parsons has joined us. We have an institute for retired professionals, a center for New York City affairs. And by the mid-1980s, the Human Relations Center has become the Vera List Center for Adult Studies, a key donor that it, I'm sure Sylvia talked about um, because she also was the instigation of the art collection that started in 1960, and by the end of her life had donated 2,000 works to the school, um, a quarter of the entire art collection. And uh, that Vera List Center for adult, adult Studies morphs into the Vera List Center for Art and Politics, which is still with us today. So finally, um, the beginning of the era that perhaps is still with us now. Um, this is, uh, uh, women are by the 70s and 80s in all roles as they were from the beginning, student, faculty, administrator, donor, well established. And here we have a new sort of way of understanding um, their importance by putting gender and knowledge at the center of a curriculum map in the new seminar college for, for traditional age undergraduates. Um, this is a really important and fascinating map. Only want to suggest that um, if you did read the Learner article, I think of it as a, an angle of vision or a stance as she talks about it, which demands that women be included in whatever topic is under discussion. Um, by 1990, and that is the work largely of Anne Snittow, who I will talk about um, now and who wrote the other article that I recommended to be read. Um, by 1990, Anne Snittow and the anthropologist uh, Raina Rapp began working toward a degree program in gender studies, which uh, a graduate degree program, and opened for students in the fall of, 19, uh, of 1993. The program um, hires Jackie Alexander, a post-colonial scholar who focuses on the Caribbean in a three-year visiting appointment, and this hire is the beginning of the end for gender studies at that point because her leaving the university after three years prompted a protest, uh, predominantly from students in gender studies, to keep Alexander and make her a tenured faculty member. There's a hunger strike, which ends up with a student in the hospital, a takeover of the president's offices. And its activities in the spring of 1997 were actually filmed by a master's student in media studies, studies Laura po Poitras, who used that as her senior thesis, or her, her thesis, master's thesis. Gender studies as a MA is closed in 1998 by Judith Friedlander, the dean of the GF at the time, the graduate faculty, who claims that its suspension was not related to what we have called the mobilization, but because of concern over its quality. Now, I should just say that there is, in fact, an undergraduate minor in junior, gender studies across the university and a certificate at the graduate level. 
This is a complicated and quite painful episode in the university's history, what we call the mobilization, and it has yet to be told fully. It has to do with the place of the graduate faculty and in an institution that is moving its focus towards undergraduate education. It has to do with the arrival of post-colonial theory and identity politics in the academy and beyond. And perhaps more specific to this story, it has to do with our enduring inability to integrate racial issues into the curriculum to hire faculty and staff of color to recruit and retain students of color. But I think it also has to do with the challenge in giving all women their rightful place in society, the academy, and at the new school. The university archivist Wendy Shire and I conducted an oral history of Anne Snittow for our archives, and after she related the beginnings and ends and beginnings again of gender studies, I couldn't help but ask, why the heck was this so difficult? Particularly at a place that had a large number of female students, administrators, donors, and relatively speaking, faculty, at an institution progressive in its rhetoric and sometimes in practice. She was silent for a bit and shook her head, and then just burst out with one word, Sexism. What was striking about that moment in the interview is that she didn't lead me to expect that. Um, there was a focus on action, a great deal of humility in understanding her own tangled role in the mobilization and the complicated role of race and gender studies and at the New School, and tremendous appreciation for other faculty and students especially who had played a pivotal role in what had been accomplished. What hadn't come up was the larger oppression and discrimination she was and is combating. But after years and years of fighting for gender studies at the, new, at the university, it was the only answer that made any sense. She didn't want it to be the answer, but maybe it was. In the essay I suggested that people read, Snittow asked some necessary questions. Why do we for continue to forget what women have accomplished? Why are they not central to our history, even when in a place such as the new, new school, they are clearly central? She asked a cognitive psychologist on our faculty about the process of remembering and forgetting to try to formulate an answer. Bill Hurst suggests that only some memories stick, those that are simplified, repeated, with vivid actors and theatrical moments. The other side of the question is pertinent too. How do you make parts of a story disappear? You tell the story again and again, leaving out the parts that one thinks are distracting, uninteresting, or contrary. Groups seek a shared narrative and whatever doesn't fit fades from the account. The history of the women's movement works against stickiness, she argues. There's no master narrative deliberately so as not to exclude or marginalize the many actors. There's no promise of closure or happiness. There are few photos. As Anne suggests, there's some useful analogies to the new school, um, the history of the new school. Our ever focus on the new implies a rejection of the past, much less an investigation. This is literally true in that only in the last few years do we actually have an archives. The scrapbooks I showed earlier in the talk were moldering in the bottom corner of a shelf in the library before a researcher noticed them about 10 years ago. Secondly, in the psychoanalytic framework that Anne discusses, are we killing Mother Hannah if we insist on the significant significance of Clara Mayer and Alice Rice Cook? How can we recognize the enormous value of Mayer and Cook as different from, but as important as, such a significant but conventional academic heroine as Arendt? Thirdly, if we understand education as growth, do we hold on to well-established signposts Dewey, Arendt, instead of insisting on messiness and ambiguity, characteristics that are inherent in growth. In the research on the Human Relations Center that I did for this talk, for instance, I kept on asking exactly how are these courses offered here different from the ones at the adult division, except for the intended audience, Mrs. Middle Age Leisure Time. I asked this specific question of the person who took over the Viralist Center for Adult Studies and um, was responsible for its reinvention. Um, and she had no answer whatsoever. She couldn't answer that. There are many such examples of a program starting, stopping, seeming to replicate another with no clear reasoning as to why. Finally, evoking Anne's outburst and understanding our institution as unique, as progressive, as we constantly do, as giving a prominent role to women from the outset, do we evade and look away from the continued gender and racial discrimination in our midst? One of the directives I take from Anne's essay is that we have to tell stories and histories in such a way as, so as to constantly repeat what we want to remember. And when a place is constantly reinventing, prioritizing that as a value and operating principle as we do here, it's even harder to tell a story that sticks. Our focus on change, however, masks one constant in all the re 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 reinvention 
women significantly formed the new school and continue to do so. When we look to the past, the present, and especially the future, look around. Women were, are, and will be here. I do not think it's an accident that Gerda Lerner ended up coming to the new school as an older woman to finish her undergraduate degree and went on to be one of the originators of women's history. The school was open enough that a dedicated, experienced woman could create the education she wanted, excel, and guide the majority to find its past. So here's the history as myth I want told and retold again and again and again. Clara Mayer chose not to marry and not to have a baby, but to make a school. And she fashioned that school in her image. Bold, curious, <laughs> sorry. I can't believe I'm so upset. <laughs> yeah, but she's such a hero of mine. Bold, curious, unworried about convention, devoted to learning and opportunity for all throughout one's life. This is my new school. Thank you.